Right. Well, thank you very much. As I say, um, um, good to uh, good to be giving this another speech to you. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about Iceland, a, a favourite country of mine, and really, I'm going to concentrate this evening on talking about Iceland in the winter. Uh, often, when I give these talks, um, I, I talk about the, the, the Iceland during the spring and summer period when there are lots and lots of birds uh, and 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 uh, the flowers are in bloom, and it's a beautiful. Uh, place to go and see for the wildlife but also I think I feel that winter time is, is, is a beautiful time of year to be there too it's, it's a very different season uh, and there's a lot more snow and ice about sorry I forgot to introduce myself properly then uh, I'm David I, uh, uh, I've, David Phillips I've been working for Nature Trek now for the past four years uh, and I lead a number of tours um, but I manage tours that are mostly in northern Europe eastern Europe and a few odds around the world, uh, other than such as Namibia and, and Taiwan and, and, and some of the tours that we run in the States. But Iceland, I would say, is probably my favourite country of, of all. Um, so here we are. Uh, this is a slide, as I say, talking here about the, the summer, uh, where all the, the, the breeding birds go up to fly up to Iceland, such as the uh, Great Northern Divers and Arctic Terns and Redneck Phalaropes and Slavonian Greaves there in this photograph are there in their full full finery, their full breeding plumage during those summer months. But like I say, I'm, I'm so keen this evening to, to deviate slightly from the norm uh, and talk about our two winter trips that we operate. Um, on this map of showing the country, uh, I've highlighted two regions that I'm going to talk about uh, um, primarily. Uh, that is the region in the northeast there. You can see an arrow uh, indicating the area of Lake Nivat. Uh, in the northeast, and one of our tours focuses on that area in the winter, uh, and also uh, over in the uh, west of the country, the Snæfellsnes Peninsula uh, and the town of Stikisholmer, you can see highlighted there by another arrow, uh, and that features heavily in, in another tour that we run in a March. Both of these places are also part of our, our summer and autumn itineraries as well, um, but uh, as I say, Winter is what I'm talking about tonight, and these are the two tours. So we have on the left-hand side the uh, Northern Lights and Winter Wildlife Tour. This one flies into uh, Keflavik, which is the airport for Reykjavik, uh, spends the first half of the tour traveling around the area, which we familiarly call the, the Golden Circle. Uh, these are particular highlights around the Reykjavik area, uh, before then spending a further three nights up in uh, Stigsholmer, uh, and along the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, uh, up in the uh, on that uh, west coast near the um, uh, the so just south of the Western Fjords, and by that large bay uh, which we call Breidisfjord, uh, where there is a little whale symbol there because we go out whale watching uh, on that tour. And then I'll also, uh, in fact, I'll start off by talking about the Jeff Falcons and Northern Lights tour, which is the tour that you can see on the right-hand map. That one starts in Reykjavik. And then uh, after the first night in Reykjavik, flies up, internal flight up to Akareli, the town on the north coast there, uh, and takes uh, about an hour and a bit to drive from there through to Lake Nivak and that area, um, which is uh, very scenic and has a lot of geothermal activity and volcanic activity. So this is the uh, flight of that, that, that trip when we've um, spent the night in Reykjavik on the Falcons tour. We then board a small plane, 50-seater Fokker 50 flight uh, propellers, takes you up to Akareli Airport, and this is uh, getting off that aircraft, and immediately you're into a much more snowier scene. Yes, you can certainly have snowy days down in Reykjavik, but up in the north, it's, it's almost continually snowy, uh, or there's snow on the ground, uh, and, and it's icy, and, it, and it's a much more uh, sort of wintry type of scene. And as you drive through from Akareli through to Lake Nivad, about a halfway through the journey, we stop off at a waterfall. This is called Godafoss. And it's a particularly scenic waterfall, I feel. Uh, this is a photograph that I took back in February of 2014 on one of the trips I used to make up there very frequently during the winter period. Uh, and the ice you can see there encrusting the, uh, the, the waterfall and the snow laying round about it. It really is a, a, a beautiful, beautiful sight. This, particular waterfall is called Godafoss, which means the waterfall of the gods, because back in the year 1000, the gentleman who owned the land around there was attending the parliament, and he was the speaker of the parliament, 
Uh, and this, on this particular occasion, there was great debate about whether or not uh, Iceland should adopt Christianity or remain uh, the, with the, the Norse religions. Uh, and he decided that they should take on Christianity. Uh, and when he came back to his homestead, which lay very close to this falls, he picked up the, the idols, the, the heathen idols of the Norse uh, mythology, and he threw them into the waterfall. And ever since, that particular waterfall has been known as Golafoss, the waterfall of the gods. And it's a really beautiful place to start your, your time up in the north. And then as you travel through from there, through to uh, Lake Mivat, uh, you come across a river, the, the Laxau, which flows, flows out from Mivat. Uh, and along that river, you start to see some interesting bird life. And these two species of duck, you're quite likely to see at that point. You'll almost certainly see the top bird, uh, which is the Barrow's golden eye. Uh, and you may well see harlequin ducks, or, although they are often out at sea in this put period and then move inland uh, as, as we get towards the end of February. So we may see them on the sea a little later on in the trip, but we may see them uh, on the river Laxau as it exits from uh, the lake of Mivat. Both species here are ones that uh, breed normally in the US, uh, or do breed in the US, but uh, Iceland is the easternmost breeding ground of these two species. So they are uh, within the, uh, all of our European bird books, but we very rarely see them in the UK. So they're a very exciting bird to see up there in Iceland. During the winter time, the lake itself is frozen solid. Uh, this particular picture I took in a December up in Iceland uh, with the sun well, actually below the horizon, you can see the Earth's shadow there, uh, just skimming the horizon, that lovely bluey pinky light that you get in the, uh, the Arctic over the winter periods. There's less daylight, of course, than uh, during the other months of the year, um, but it does increase considerably by the time we get to February uh, and March, when obviously the equinox, we have equal daylight and, and, and darkness. But, but nonetheless, the, the scene is one of, of snow and ice and the lake there again frozen over um, this shot is taken from just outside uh, the hotel that we use up in the north there uh, on the shores of, of Lake Nima. And these are what we call pseudo craters, which were formed about 4,000 years ago as runny lava from nearby volcanoes uh, flow, flew, flew, flooded out across um, the marshy land and superheated the ground beneath uh, and caused explosions uh, which formed these pseudo craters. And, and they're a very interesting part of the the landscape up there. This particular part of Iceland is part of that volcanic belt, so there's a lot of, of geothermal and volcanic activity round about. This is uh, some shots from the hotel cell which we use, and it's very typical of, of a lot of the hotels that we use in Iceland. They're, they're simply furnished, but very, very clean and comfortable, offering good breakfast buffets, um, but, but as I say, a, a really good base to use. Uh, to, to explore the area and, and as quite typical of, of the sorts of hotels throughout Iceland. Elsewhere around the lake, as I say, it's part of that volcanic belt. So, uh, so there are bubbling mud pools and there are fumaroles belching uh, smoke and, and steam uh, suffused with hydrogen sulfide. So it, the air is very, very pungent in that particular area. Uh, and, uh, and the surface of, of the landscape looks almost like it's from another planet. Bird life is, is much less uh, abundant, of course, in the winter period. We don't have all the migrants that arrive for breeding, um, but there are some interesting species nonetheless. The red wing is a commonly seen bird, uh, particularly around Reykjavik, in fact. Uh, it comes very close to you, a bit like sort of robins do in this country. It'll come close to, to you if you're sitting on one of the park benches there. Um, the snow buntings up in the top right there, you'll see flocks of snow buntings quite commonly around Iceland. Uh, and, and the uh, raven down at the bottom, the only corvid in Iceland and a common bird there. On the lakes, on Lake Mivat, but also in other areas around Iceland, the uh, hooper swan uh, is, is a, a very commonly seen during the summer and in the winter, some of the, some of the birds remain uh, up there. Of course, a lot of them fly down to, uh, to, to the shores of the, of the UK uh, during the winter period, but one or two of them, well, a number of them remain up in Iceland uh, still there on the, on the icy lake, so they're a lovely bird to see. But the um, eastern shore of, of Lake Nivat is dominated by a, a, a large um, explosion crater called Krefjak, uh, and this is a, a lovely picture, well, picture of a, the, the profile of that particular crater, it's about a kilometre across, 
Um, and as you skirt around the lake on the roads, it, it's, it really dominates the landscape, a, a, a marvellous uh, scene. And as you're driving around that area, there's a couple of birds that you tend to look for in that area. Uh, one is the ptarmigan. Uh, this is a, a bird, of course, that uh, turns very white during the, uh, the winter season. Uh, it's, it's color changes throughout the year, but in the winter it, it camouflages itself against the snow by becoming almost pure white and a beautiful bird to see, although obviously quite hard to track down white against the, the snowy sort of background. And it's nemesis and the bird that names this particular trip is the Jer falcon. Uh, this is the, the big daddy of the falcons, the largest member of the falcon family and, uh, and, and quite a bird to see and what of course a lot of people want to travel to, to Iceland to see. And this is a common, commonly seen around uh, the shores of Lake Mivat, uh, perching up on lava, uh, lava columns in the Dimugogir uh, uh, reserve area, um, but also seen flying around elsewhere around the lake. I've actually seen them as, as well, even flying down the high street in Reykjavik, or while well, I've been walking down the high street, they've flown overhead, let's say. Um, but that, they're less common in the south there, or less common uh, in, in that sort of urban environment, but uh, you do tend to see them in certain places around the, the lake shores there and around the, the, the country as a whole. As whilst we're up in near that, we take us a, a detour or a, a, an excursion, shall I say, down to Husavik, uh, the town on the coast. Uh, this is an old fishing um, uh, harbour uh, where which has a superb whale watching museum or whaling museum, I should say, because it comprises both historical uh, elements with whaling, but also a lot about whale watching. And, and Husavik is really the, the whale watching capital of Europe. Uh, because in the bay there in the summertime you get humpback whales and blue whales uh, which we see on our summer and uh, summer and spring and summer trips um, and the whale museum there uh, highlights those and the work being done by the, uh, the whale watching teams that uh, are up in Husavik. In the sea by Husavik we have some good uh, bird life to see. Uh, as I say the, the harlequin ducks that you see in the top left there they may well still be on the sea in February they're up on the, the by the by the lake in, in by certainly by the end of February, going into March. Uh, so we would hope to see them in one or other place there. Fulmers, of course, on the sea there. Eider ducks, uh, bottom left, very commonly seen all around Iceland. Sometimes you'll see a king eider amongst them, uh, but the common eider is a, a very common bird in the harbours there. As is the long-tailed duck there that you can see on the bottom right in its in its winter winter plumage. Also uh, in that area around uh, that, if, uh, if, if the conditions allow, we take an excursion out to see the, the largest waterfall uh, in Europe, which is Detifoss, this uh, most powerful of waterfalls in Iceland, uh, a big drop of some 70 meters uh, and a beautiful canyon that runs up um, to, the, to the south of it, up into the mountains. This has been carved out by, uh, by, by a flood that create, was created by the uh, glacier um, breaching and creating a flood that swept down the valley and carved out this uh, particular uh, canyon uh, thousands of years ago. Um, now going on to the, the the other tour that I mentioned, this tour that occurs in March, we run it in March, Northern Lights and Winter Wildlife it's called, and this one we start off uh, in Reykjavik and cover the Golden Circle route which is well known to many people who visited Iceland before heading up to the Snæfellsnes Peninsula. Golden Circle comprises of three main sites, the Thingvellir National Park, where the, famously the rifts uh, is occurring between the North American plate uh, and the Eurasian plate, and that can be seen here uh, on different sides of this particular rift feature. Uh, the, uh, another waterfall, and there are many waterfalls in Iceland, this is one called Gutlfoss, or the Golden Waterfall, uh, and this one is again part of that uh, golden circle, a beautiful, beautiful waterfall called the Golden Waterfall because in the evening light, the steam that uh, comes up from it uh, is often made to look quite golden as it catches the evening sunlight. And Geysir, uh, this is Troka, which is one of the geysers uh, at town, uh, the place of Geysir, uh, which gives name to, of course, the two geysirs themselves. Uh, and this one erupts roughly between every five and 10 minutes and, and uh, has a plume of steam and, and water uh, up to sort of 10, 15, 20 meters in the air. Uh, so that's a, a very interesting feature to see. 
Then we head up towards uh, Stickisholmer, uh, and just by near Stickisholmer is uh, Kukufet. This is a, a very well-known mountain. People will have seen photographs of this doubtlessly because it is, it's such an iconic uh, scene and, and one that's photographed by so many photographers. In the winter, again, looks absolutely stunning with the waterfall to the left uh, and the mountain, the mountain, the church mountain, Kukufet, uh, on the right-hand side there. We go to this area principally because uh, in wintertime in Bredesfjord, the uh, bay to the north, uh, it's uh, where certain whale species and dolphin species come into the bay, uh, notably orca uh, and sperm whale. And we put all our uh, tog up, we tog up with real winter gear and waterproofs uh, from, the, uh, from the boat company and head out to try and find those whales. Orcas here come in to see, to, to find the herring in that bay. Uh, and, and, and can be seen in good numbers in certain years, and, and nearly every year we see them uh, in, in Bredesfjord. Uh, and sperm whale, this is a sperm whale coming very, very close to, to one of the boats uh, on, the, on the watching before, uh, on the whale watching before, obviously it descending beneath the boat. You can tell it's a sperm whale because the blowhole there is at a slight angle, about 45 degree angle. You can tell that at a distance, you can always recognize a sperm whale by the, the, the angle at which the, the plume of, uh, of, of of, of air comes out from its blowhole. But of course, and if you've traveled to the north in winter periods, to places like Iceland and Norway, as Sarah will be talking about shortly, you hope to see the northern lights. And you can see them there as long as it's dark. So really you're looking at the period between sort of September through to March, April time, when it's dark enough and long for long enough periods of the night. If you spend a bit of time outside, uh, and you're up there for a good length of time, you're very likely to encounter the Northern Lights. Uh, this is a shot taken from North, North, Northern Iceland by a, a friend of mine, Martin, uh, who, who works and lives now up in Iceland. And uh, it shows that beautiful curtain, curtainry and, and uh, structure to, to the, the Northern Lights and that green light that you see most commonly when you're up in those sort of higher uh, latitudes. And that is the light of, of oxygen uh, emissions in the in the atmosphere. Um, this is another shot taken up in Iceland by by Peter Dunn, uh, one of the uh, sadly uh, gentleman who died last year uh, of COVID, but uh, used to be a, a regular guide for us uh, and, and a great colleague. And he took uh, uh, many fantastic shots of the aurora uh, and other wildlife whilst he was up in Iceland for us. And this is a shot showing that. The, the way that aurora often develop of an evening uh, from a, a, an arc, what we term a quiescent arc, that sort of almost less featured or featureless arc, which straddles the sky from the northeast to the northwest across the northern sky. And then as it develops, as the evening goes on, you tend to get these sort of filaments and rays and structure develop uh, along those arcs. So you get this sort of beautiful curtains and, and structure and movement, which I, I feel no, no, uh, no video, although many of them exist now, no video really does justice to, because a whole sky, a rural display is, is something to behold, something to savour. And what are they caused by? Well, it's caused by particles that are emitted from the sun. Uh, the solar wind, which is emitted continuously from the sun at a speed of about four to 500 kilometres per second, is full of charged particles, which, travel across between the, the, the sun and the earth over a period of about four days. And those particles interact with this envelope around the earth called the magnetosphere. It's the magnetic field of the earth uh, and it interacts with that magnetosphere and gets channeled in towards the polar regions of the earth. And as those uh, particles get channeled down towards the, the, the polar regions, they excite the molecules within the earth's atmosphere give rise to very specific colours. Uh, and this chart just shows you uh, how high up in the sky those aurora are. People think when they see them that they are a, almost they could reach out and touch an aurora, but actually even the lower edge of, of an auroral curtain is around about 100 kilometres up. So it's way above the height of the commercial airliner that you can see there at the bottom and really reaches up almost to the, to the edge of space. Uh, to, to where the, the ISS I mean, it shows the space shuttle there. It's a bit of an old slide. ISS, however, goes across at the same sort of a, uh, altitude. Uh, and you may have seen the sort of images of the ISS going through the International Space Station, that is going through the, 
the, the aurora and, 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 and above the aurora. So it's really a very, very long way up, but it's an amazing phenomenon to see. And in order to see it, you really need to go to high latitudes. Yes, we do from time to time see the aurora from, from the UK and from certainly from the north of Scotland is commonly seen. But to see those sort of really detailed structures and curtains and arcs, uh, I've never seen those in the UK. I've only ever seen them when I've traveled to more northerly latitudes. Uh, and, and essentially, you need to be under an area of the globe called the auroral oval. And that's what's depicted, uh, at least the northern auroral oval is depicted on this chart. It's a, a, a donut of, of land, effectively, that is um, centered on the geomagnetic pole. Now, the geomagnetic pole, uh, which is where the, all the compass points, the compasses point to, uh, is, is currently actually moving quite close to the geographic North Pole. Um, but the geomagnetic North Pole is the centre of this, this circle of, of, of aurora, if you like. Uh, and as you can see from here, if you're in northern Iceland over there on the sort of right hand side, the three o'clock position on this, uh, this chart, this map, or, or if you're in northern Norway, there at the sort of two o'clock position, then you're underneath that auroral oval. And that's where you really need to be to reliably stand a good chance of seeing aurora uh, during the winter period. And as I say, if you spend three or four nights uh, in, the, in the, that sort of latitude uh, and you um, have clear skies, there is a very good chance you'll see aurora at some point. Now, aurora, people often sort of think that it has a strong tie in with uh, the sun's uh, activity. And yes, it does to an extent. Sun has a, a cycle, an activity cycle, which is 11 years from one peak to another. Uh, but you don't actually have to be uh, in the period when, when it's at its maximum in order to see aurora. Uh, you can see here that it does have, a, as I say, a very cyclical sort of uh, uh, level of, of activity of sunspots and other uh, emissions and activity. And at the moment, we're really quite low down in that activity level. Back in 2012, people were, were clamoring to go up to Iceland and, and Norway to see the aurora because they thought this was the time to see it because the sun's at its maximum. Yes, that is certainly true. Uh, but even during minimum, you can see a lot of auroral activity because what happens uh, during minimum, you get a lot of coronal holes, as we call them. This is a, uh, an actual a hole emerging in the, in the the outer atmosphere of the sun, the corona of the sun. And from those areas, you get a lot more uh, uh, particles from the sun emerging at greater speed. And those actually give you a greater background level of aurora. So, so you actually stand just as good chance or almost as good chance at solar minimum as you do at solar maximum. And also, in fact, it, it's a bit time of year dependent. If you are looking for the aurora, you really uh, want to go again during sort of uh, February, March, April or September, October, because there's a, a high amount of geomagnetic activity during those times as well. So that, that's another thing to consider. But these pictures, I just want to finish on two photographs now, uh, which were taken last month by a friend of mine, uh, Martin, the same chap I mentioned earlier, who took the earlier photograph from the north of Iceland. This is during solar minimum. And yet, here we are, he's uh, up at Niva taking some utterly spectacular uh, views of the, uh, of the aurora as it passes uh, over in through the skies and illuminates the skies above the, uh, the hills and lake uh, in the northeast of Iceland. And what a gorgeous view that is. I really have to say that having spent many, many winters up there, there is nothing like seeing aurora for yourself. It's something which everyone should try and see once in their lifetime. I can't recommend it highly enough. So thank you very much. Uh, that's, a, that's a brief tour of Iceland in winter. As I say, quite a contrast from how it appears in the, in the, in the summer uh, and, and the things that we go to look for in the summer months when, of course, it's light almost the entire time. In the winter, it has its own uh, appeal for sure uh, with landscapes and geology and northern lights and some, still some very interesting birds to go and see during those months as well. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll end there and hand you back to Sarah.